Uh, there we go. And where is Samarium on here? I can never remember where it is on the... There. No. Oh yeah, there it is. Samarium. We're making a new video about Samarium. Our first video of Samarium, we had a really rather poor sample. This is a sample of Samarium and there's a very small amount of it here. It was packed in Argon, had come to the university several months before I came and I've been here 45 years. I think that this sample has perhaps become damaged because I think the package may be broken. So all you could see was a white powder. Which I suspect is Samarium oxide. And there's a little surprise from that white powder that we will tell you at the end. But we now, thanks to our friend Anthony Lipman and his friends at Less Common Metals, we have a sample of Samarium and also a sample of Samarium mixed with cobalt because when you mix cobalt and Samarium it produces really quite a surprising property. The reactions of Samarium got Neil and Brady really excited. I've never seen them enthusing so much about test tubes. I hope you will enthuse as well. Samarium was discovered in 1879 by the um, French chemist Lecoq. He has a longer name, which I can never remember. And he discovered Samarium in a sample of a mineral called Samarskite, which was named after a Russian mineralogist or mining officer called Samarsky Bichovitz. So in a way, the Samarium is the first element to be named after a person. Oh yeah, I didn't think of that. It's like indirectly named after a person. Yeah. Though of course, he had nothing to do with it except giving somebody the piece of rock. This is an interesting rock. You have to understand that in those days, the way that these elements were identified was usually by the spectra, the light they gave up when they were heated very highly in a Bunsen flame or whatever. And when you're purifying a mixture of materials, you may see several lines from different elements. And all you can do is to keep on purifying it and purifying it and purifying it to see which of the lines disappear and which ones are left. And this is what Lecoq did. And eventually he came up with this element. And in the paper, you can see where it says that he chose this name, Samarium. And there was a rival who thought he had discovered this element or a different element, which he called decrypium, which turned out to be mixture. So if you look at the metal, we had an unboxing because it came, well, unenveloping. It came in a sealed package. The actual metal was vacuum packed because it reacts quite easily with oxygen. And when the metal finally came out of its vacuum pack, it was quite a dark color. The second sample in the package was the alloy, the mixture of cobalt and samarium. And there's a big difference between the two samples, apart from the samarium being a darkish color and the samarium cobalt looking shiny and metallic. But the other difference was that the samarium itself is not attracted to even quite a powerful magnet, whereas the cobalt samarium jumps up in the air when you show it a magnet. Samarium cobalt magnets are really important where you need a powerful magnet that's very small. So we'd read that samarium reacted with weak acids, dilute acids, so Neil chose dilute hydrochloric acid and he dropped a piece of samarium 
into the test tube of dilute hydrochloric acid. And immediately it began fizzing with hydrogen. Well, we thought it was hydrogen and Neil demonstrated this quite convincingly with a lighted splint. It gave a delightful pop. And where there was some argument, but Neil and Brady were certain that when it first went in, the solution went a reddish colour or pinkish colour. I wasn't completely convinced. So we put in a larger lump of metal so the concentrations would all be higher. And there was no doubt it went this purplish colour. But then as we watched, it became a sort of whitish colour and the purple disappeared altogether. And after quite a bit of thought, we realised this is because when the reaction begins, you make samarium 2 plus chloride, and then as the reaction proceeds, it gets further oxidised and you get samarium 3 plus. And if you look it up, samarium 2 plus chloride is described as brown or red, and the samarium 3 chloride is pale yellow. Why does it change, Professor? Why does it do one and then the other? I think it's because when it is formed initially, you have a high concentration of hydrogen, which is a very reducing atmosphere. And then as the reaction takes place, the amount of hydrogen or relative concentration of hydrogen to the salts in solution changes, and then it's energetically favourable to form the 3 plus because most of these rare earth or lanthanide elements tend to form 3 plus salts. 2 plus are quite unusual. And then at the end, Neil tipped away the solution into other test tubes, which were used from some reactions. I'll tell you about in a moment. But when he washed the metal that was left, he got a pale yellow colour, which confused us a bit, but then turns out almost certainly to be the samarium trichloride, which is reported to have a pale yellow lemony colour. So we ended up with several test tubes of the solution of samarium chloride, and we decided to test it with various reactions. The first one we tried was sodium sulphide, which unfortunately, because we hadn't neutralised the acid, produced unpleasant smells of rotten eggs, of hydrogen sulphide, and there was a small suggestion of precipitate, but it wasn't very exciting. But then we put in hydroxide and the hydroxide, of course, neutralises the acid and precipitated a very nice white precipitate. Oh yeah, that one's doing it. Which almost certainly, though we didn't analyse it, is samarium hydroxide or perhaps a hydrated oxide. As always, Brady and Neil got excited when they saw these precipitates, so we thought we would try potassium chromate. And we got a very nice yellow precipitate. Most chromates and dichromates are insoluble, so it's not surprising, but it makes a nice picture as you see these precipitates forming. In general, precipitates form very rapidly. So even with a high-speed camera, you can't see it nucleating, 
but you get nice pictures. So to end up with, Neil always likes to make some filings from the metals. And see if they burn. And Samarium didn't disappoint. It gave a good crackling noise. And also quite a nice purplish pinkish color which presumably is the emission of very hot samarium atoms. So this brings us back to the original sample that's been unopened for more than 45 years. Neil couldn't resist opening it. And among the white powder, he still found a very thin square of samarium. It was very brittle. He could snap it very easily. I don't know whether it could have been snapped originally or whether it had aged over time, but it shows that the packaging was sufficiently good to preserve it for more than 45 years, which I think is quite impressive. It also allows you to see a nice clean sample of samarium oxide. So you've got an extra compound and a nice bit of metal, and you've learned some more about samarium. You can support this channel and have your name appear here on the periodic table of patrons. Have a look at all these people who help us out. And by the way, we don't have a Samarium supporter yet. That piece of real estate could be all yours. To find out more, go to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash periodic videos. There'll be a link in the description, all the usual places. We appreciate everyone who gives us that bit of extra help. And by the way, we always upload little extra bits and pieces for those patrons. For this video, I've put some extended footage of all the experiments, including some stuff that didn't quite make the cut for this video. And it's all set to some beautiful music too. Why don't you go and have a look? Follow the links. Brady has been to a really amazing lab where they're synthesizing plutonium. That'll start pressing and that'll start the same operation again for another dye. The flame came out a beautiful lavender color. Lavender is the color that arsenic burns with.